Good morning and welcome. Come on and have a seat. Sit down. Welcome to our church this morning. Um, for those who you are watching and viewing online, welcome also. And um, we, we also have, welcome our, our deaf constituent who are viewing online as well. Thank you. Um, my job is to uh, welcome you and give you some announcements. Um, most of them are on the screen, and the pastor has graciously um, emailed uh, those announcements to you during the week, so pay attention. There is a Bible study here today. Um, we have Wednesday prayer service at 8 o'clock, and youth is meeting tonight. And remember, our youth is collecting tin cans and aluminum cans, so please bring them to church. Uh, there's a place in the back where you can place them. Um, it, it's a fundraiser this, this, uh, this year, so please support that. Thank you. And also, thank you for um, supporting Your Loving Choices, which is our Crisis Pregnancy Center uh, in town. And if your bottles are filled, you can bring them to the church, and I will take care of them. Or Ruth Joy and Al, our, our uh, executive, uh, um, executive director, uh, will also uh, is here to take care of that, too. And then there's extras, so please take one with you. One of these, you can change lives one coin at a time. All righty. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. For you have made it, and we shall be glad. We worship you because you first loved us. And Father, I can't wait to hear the message of the unfinished business that we have here on earth because you are finished business was done at the cross and we thank you for that father for for your your life for dying for your resurrection that we have power over sin and death because of what you've done for us and we give you glory and we thank you for that father i ask that you would bless each bless each aspect of this service today our worship the technology your word father challenge our hearts that we might know and grow closer to you this day for this day you have made us to be here and and to be alive to, to worship you living god we thank you for all that you're going to do today we give you the glory and we all said amen good morning what a beautiful day you know what? Spring starts on Saturday. We're within a week of spring. What an awesome thing. So the day is beautiful. <clears throat> You'll need to sing loudly today. I spent the last two days working outside and evidently didn't have enough covering on. This morning woke up with a little bit of a, you know, congestion, sore throat, so you're going to cover for me. <laughs> ben, thank you for coming up this morning and uh, doing a wonderful job on the keyboard. And uh, it's, we always enjoy uh, listening to Ben. Let's all stand, and we're going to sing hymn number 87, which is May Jesus Christ Be Praised. We have four verses we'll sing.
sing. We're going to go to hymn number 542, When We All Get to Heaven. Can't wait for that. If you're not going there and you're not assured of that, you need to talk to somebody in this church today. And so we want you to see pastor the elders before you walk out of here. When we all get to heaven. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Let us then be true and faithful, trusting, serving every day. Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. Onward to the prize before us, soon his beauty will be old. Soon the pearly gates will open, we shall tread the streets of gold. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll see shout the victory. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I wanted someone to take a moment and pray for our sister Sharon hasn't been well uh, I just want someone if you would just lift her up you know the challenges she has sometimes with the coughs and uh, allergies so if someone can pray for Sharon just raise your hand and pray for her out loud anybody uh, sister Deb please So spring is around the air. Spring is coming in. It's coming in soon. And uh, we have some uh, big activity services coming up. We have Resurrection Sunday, Palm Sunday. We have a movie night on the 2nd of April. Uh, Amazing Love, the story of Hosea. I encourage you to begin to start praying about that and see who you can invite to church for that day uh, for those important services. And we praise God for the warmer weather. We're hoping for a better summer than last summer. Amen. We're hoping for a better outcome. So, okay, so uh, how many of you are happy to be here? <laughs> amen, amen. Thank God it's not all that cold out there. I saw someone jumping in our garbage dump out there this morning, but I won't mention any names. But I was a little nervous, you know, a little feeling nervous and scared there. Who was that and who was... But praise God, we're here. Amen? So um, I wanted to tell you a story. When, when my wife and I, first, the first church that we pastored, we were, we were so excited one day when we were told that on that day the, the cabinet repairmen were going to come to the house and they were going to remove the old, grungy, ugly, dirty-looking cabinets in our kitchen. 
and so we went about our business we, we were looking you know forward to get home to see our our cabinets but sure enough evening comes we're ready to go into our kitchen you know and um, when we're ready to see the you know brand new well measured well placed you know cabinets that we're going to bring life into our parsonage kitchen and when we walked in there we were immediately dismayed there was a six to eight inch gap between two of the cabinets someone messed up in the measurements someone messed up in the arrangements and in the ordering of these cabinets I don't know where Dave was in those days but uh, someone messed up big time and when we got there we we're expecting to see the job complete the job finished but it was unfinished and boy were we disappointed remember that all excited you know I covered all the holes for the mice and all that everything was all set you know and here yeah someone messed up big time I want us to um, turn together to the book of Philemon we'll be reading from Philemon today the book of Philemon in spite of Patty's assessment does not have 72 verses uh, but we're gonna read the first seven verses of the book of Philemon it's only one got one chapter Philemon chapter 1 verses 1 2 3 Paul a prisoner for Christ Jesus and Timothy our brother to Philemon our beloved fellow worker and a fear our sister and our keepers our fellow soldier and the church in your house grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and then in verses 4 through 7 Paul says I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus and for all the Saints and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived, says Paul, much joy and much comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. <clears throat> and so the epistle of Paul to Philemon is his shortest of all epistles. It was it was written perhaps in 61 AD while Paul was undergoing his first Roman imprisonment. And we're going to talk a little bit about this letter, the, this letter, this epistle from Paul to Philemon. But before we do that, would you please stand with me and join me in prayer? We'll title this message, Unfinished Business. Unfinished Business. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. We praise you this morning for your grace and your love, God. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you that we can sing and we can rejoice and we can get excited when we think about heaven when we all get to heaven. We look forward to those days, but God, we thank you that even here on earth we can have a taste of heaven as we seek your face and seek to honor you and to grow in you. And so, God, we praise you and we worship you this morning. We invite you, Spirit of the Lord, to guide our service. We invite you, Spirit of the Lord, to, to guide the recordings of these messages that you want to get into the homes of, of viewers, people who are searching and who want to know whose hearts you're working in, God. And so we pray that you would guide these Facebook and, the, and the, the church website and the YouTube, that you would guide and direct, that you would guard and guide even through the Internet, oh God, in the name of Jesus. We pray that you would, Holy Spirit, protect us as we continue to challenge, be challenged with this pandemic. We pray that you would continue to bring cleansing. We pray that you would continue to remove the virus and remove sicknesses and colds, oh God, in the name of Jesus, as, as we entrust our health to you, that dear Lord, not just physically, but spiritually, emotionally. And so, Holy Spirit, we invite you to, to bring cleansing even within this sanctuary this morning. And we pray that you would prepare our hearts, even now, dear God, for the hearing of your words. Spirit of the Lord, we invite you to speak in us. We invite you to speak to us. We invite you, Holy Spirit, to give us ears that hear and hearts that are softened and able to receive, ready to receive the word of the Lord. We pray that you would meet us right where we're at. Oh, God, you know that we're a needy people, and you know where we're at right now. And so meet us, we pray this morning, and we'll give you the glory in Jesus' name. Amen, amen, amen. Amen. That was a loud amen there. I'm okay with loud amens. So, um, so let's talk about this. So Philemon was a, a wealthy Christian. He was a wealthy Christian who lived in, in, 
in, in Colossae, and he was also uh, one who housed a church. He housed a church in his home. He had a, a church gathering. We know that up until the third century, there is no proof of any church buildings for gathering to exhort Jesus at that point. And so what would happen is that they would meet in church homes, much like our cell groups and our community group gatherings in the homes. Only difference is that their, their worship in those homes was much like ours, and our praise is on a Sunday morning. And so Philemon is, is hosting this, and we don't know, we know that, that the, the New Testament has so much to say about how God works through people and how he works in people's hearts. And so Paul, although he mentions a few people in the beginning verses, verses 1, 2, and 3, he, <clears throat> excuse me, he's mentioning a few people there, especially in verse 2. And then uh, from there on, Paul, from verse 4 and on, Paul begins to speak in first person singular. And we know from our readings that Paul is writing this letter particularly to Philemon. It's Philemon that he has in his mind and his heart. But when he writes to Philemon, he's writing to him in reference or in regard to Onesimus. Onesimus was a, uh, a runaway slave that was owned by Philemon. Now, we find in the New Testament that there is absolutely no, um, there is, there's no statements in regard to the origins of slavery. Nor is there theological support for slavery in the New Testament. But we do know that in the New Testament, we find that, that there were Christians who owned their own slaves and there were Christians who were slaves. Paul does not in any way uh, address the issue in any of his writings, does he address the issue of the problems or the evils of slavery. He doesn't condemn it. He doesn't condone it. He just doesn't address it because that was not the scope of his appeals in his writings. But if there was any book in the New Testament that attacked the issue of slavery, though not specifically, it is the book of Philemon. You see, now we are slaves in Christ. We're slaves of Jesus. We're servants of the Lord. We're his followers. We live under his direction. He gives us purpose and meaning in life. And so we're slaves of his. By the way, the word slave and servant in the New Testament Greek is actually the word doulos and it means the same thing but we're slaves of Jesus we serve him and we serve one another as we grow in the Lord and so Paul does not address the actual issue but he is addressing an issue that had to do with a particular person in this case it was Onesimus and we don't know exactly what it was that Onesimus did to offend Philemon uh, we do know that it's possible that according to verse 18 that either he stole something or he broke something uh, and, and, and then he ran away. He took off from his master. And this was a normal thing in the, during New Testament times. Uh, servants of masters or slaves of masters had a tendency to run away from their masters. And evidently what happens is for, uh, Onesimus runs in the direction of Rome and he eventually gets picked up and thrown into prison there in Rome and becomes a fellow prisoner of Paul. And Paul does what Paul does. Paul shares the gospel with, uh, with this runaway slave Onesimus. Whatever he did, Paul shares the gospel with Onesimus. And in verse 10, we find that Onesimus becomes a Christian. He becomes a follower of the Lord Jesus through the ministry of Paul. And what Paul does then, he sends uh, Tychicus with a servant, a fellow servant of Paul. You see this in Colossians 4, verses 7 through 9. But Paul sends Tychicus along with Onesimus to go back to Colossae and resolve an issue, an unfinished business between Onesimus and Philemon. And so he sends him there. By the way, Philemon himself was a product of the ministry of of Paul you see that in verse 19 and so here you got Paul the Apostle uh, through his ministry leads Philemon to Christ verse 19 and also this runaway slave that leads from Philemon runs away from him, runs into Paul what coincidence no God doesn't work like that. that those are his incidences and so God uses Paul to lead this runaway slave um, and sends him back 
to Philemon to resolve some un or an attempt to resolve some unfinished business. Now, I want you to know that Philemon had all the right in the world. He was, he was legally correct if he would punish or if he would put to death a runaway slave, okay? But Paul, in sending him there, is hoping for the opposite thing to happen. So Philemon has all the right, he is legally correct to kill this person, to punish this person, or to allow him to stay in prison. And Paul still takes this chance because why? Paul was convicted with the need to connect these two who were at odds with each other. And so he takes a chance by sending Onesimus back to Colossae to meet what, with the, his master whom he ran away from. And so Paul mentions, Paul, I want you to notice that what the Holy Spirit wants us to do for this service is to, is to look into these beginning verses of Paul's letter to Philemon as Paul begins to set the stage for the gist of his letter, the idea of resolving some unfinished business between two brothers in the Lord. And so let me, let me just speak. Paul begins his letter by identifying himself as a prisoner of Jesus Christ. That's a wise start for Paul. It's, it's appropriate because of the relationship that Onesimus and Philemon had. So he says, I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he mentions, uh, um, uh, uh, you know, scholars say that she was actually the, the wife of Philemon, of Phia, the wife of Philemon. And then Akipas was the, he was actually the son of Philemon. And some even say that he was a pastor. So he mentions these two people, the wife perhaps, the son perhaps. And then he mentions the church that meets in his house. It is possible that Onesimus stole something from someone within that group or he definitely uh, discouraged every one of them by running away from his master. And so Paul begins to address the people that are there and then he says that he is a servant. He, is a, uh, he declares himself as a servant of the Lord Jesus and then he introduces in his salutation grace and peace. Boy, did Paul need grace and peace. Uh, by the way, as he's writing this letter, I can, I can, I can, I can sense Paul writing and say, Oh God, boy, do I need this grace. Boy, do we need the peace of God. The, by the way, peace comes as a result of God's grace. And so Paul introduces grace and peace as he begins to set the stage for the gist of his letter to Philemon. By the way, we need much grace in order to deal with the conflicts of our world we need grace to deal with the circumstances of our lives not just outside the church but even within the church and so Paul says grace and peace that is found in Jesus he addresses the whole issue he begins to set the stage and so I want us now to look at the verses that set the stage for this message that has ha God has today so in verse 4 that we just read, I want you to know that Paul, what he does is he, he assures Philemon, he says to him, I pray for you. Every time I, every time I think of you, I pray for you. Paul, saying, Paul is saying, you know, you know I, I, I pray for you. Your, 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 your mind, your, my mind is fixed on you. When I pray, I think of you. When I pray, I remember you. So Paul was the type of person who was a praying man. You know that. We read throughout the epistles and the writings of Paul, we find that he was a man that he prayed for his brothers and sisters in Christ. Prayer was a pattern of life for Paul. Paul was a man of prayer. In fact, he had the convictions, the same convictions that Samuel had in 1 Samuel 12, 23, when he says, I forbid, God forbid that I should forget to pray for you. And so Paul has this same idea, by the way, when, when we're not praying for each other, you know, Samuel calls that sin. He, so he says, you know, 1 Samuel 12, 23, he says, he says I, 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 God forbid that I should sin against him. God forbid that I should sin against him by not praying for you. So Paul took that serious. Paul knew that praying for the church 
and praying for the people of God was absolutely necessary. And so he begins in verse 4 by reminding uh, uh, Philemon that he is praying for him, that he has heard of his faithfulness and he is indeed praying for them. And then he assures him, remember, remember that Paul is beginning to set the stage to bring two brothers that are at odds with each other, to bring them together. And so he begins by encouraging Philemon regarding the encouragement that Philemon has given him, that he was thankful for Philemon. He says, I hear about you, Philemon. I'm hearing about the works. I'm hearing about, by the way, again, remember, Philemon is a product of the ministry of Paul. So Paul is his spiritual parent. And so the spiritual parent is encouraged by the fact that his spiritual child is growing and learning. And so he's thankful for that. So he's setting the stage for the gist of his letter. And then I want you that in doing that, he inches, he inches slowly by slowly into the matter at hand, the purpose why he's writing this letter. Paul is very, very careful and very wise about what he's doing. And so let's notice, first of all, that Paul says, and so he says, I am thankful for your love for the saints. Okay, notice the first point there. He says to him in verse 5, I am thankful for your love for the saints. Thankful because I hear of your love for all the saints. He says, I am thankful because I hear. In other words, Paul is saying the word is getting around, Philemon. Philemon, I want you to know that the work that you're doing with the saints, the people of God, is getting around. By the way, think about that for a moment. Paul says, your love for the saints. Do you know that the Bible calls us saints? The Bible calls God calls us saints. And it doesn't mean that we are perfect. When God calls us saints, he's not saying that we are perfect. But um, we all sin. We still mess up sometimes, right? It's not that we're perfect, but because of the finished work of Jesus, because of what Christ has completed for us at the cross, because of that, Jesus has died. He went to that cross and died for every single sin that we've ever committed and every single sin that we will ever commit. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It is finished is the Greek word tetelestai, which is a word that they stamp, a word that they stamp on the bags of the fishermen or men who went to purchase fish to tell us that it is finished, it is complete. And so Jesus hung there on the cross and says, it is finished. And so God, when he sees us, he sees us as saints finished, washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. It doesn't give us the license to sin. If anything, it gives us an incentive, an incentive to live our lives for him, thus confirm that we're true followers of Jesus Christ. And so this morning, you're either a saint or an ain't. Now, I know that ain't ain't a word. And Patty will probably pull my ears later for that. Ain't ain't a word, but I think you have the idea. You're either a saint or an ain't, which is it? Now, I want you to know this. I want you to think a little further with me for a moment. If you and I were to see ourselves as God sees us, saints, um, we would have more of an incentive to live a life that honors and glorifies him because he declares you and me his saints, his sons and daughters washed in the blood. Or if we see ourselves as the enemy wants us to see us, sinners, or how we see ourselves when we mess up, then guess what? We're going to do what we think we're, what we think we are. If you see yourself as a saint, you have more reason to honor the Lord. If you see yourself as a sinner, guess what? I've heard it said before. Well, God knows I'm a sinner. That's why I don't forgive that person. Well, I responded for that to that because I'm a sinner anyway. Call yourself what God calls you. And God will change your perspective and the choices that you make in life. And so Paul says, you know, I'm encouraged. I'm thankful because of your love for all the saints. By the way, keep note on that word all there. Uh, the emphasize of all the saints. It's interesting that Paul begins his, usually Paul uses the word faith in front of the word love. He usually has faith first and then love. Not all the time, but most of the time. 
but because of the situation at hand, which is the reason why he wrote this epistle, uh, because of the situation at hand, he is focusing on Philemon's love. And it's very, very important what he's doing there. You see, Philemon's, uh, the, the object of Philemon's faith was the Lord Jesus Christ, but the object of his love was the saints, the church, the people of God. And so what Paul does, you know, Paul the Apostle is so very smart. In his approach, in this letter, what he does is he takes that, he wraps that faith clause, he wraps the faith clause with the love clause to forewarn Philemon that there's going to be an opportunity coming up so that he can exercise his faith by showing his love for a runaway slave. You see, he is setting the stage for what, the gist of his letter is all about. And so again, notice the emphasis on awe. I am thankful for the love that you have for A-L-L, all the saints. So it's a genuine concern. Paul is excited because there is this genuine concern for the saints, the people of God, the family of God, the children of God, as would be the case with any father or any mother who uh, uh, is excited and happy when he sees or she sees uh, their sons and daughters playing together, fellowshipping together, encouraging each other, working together, being there for each other, uh, being sisters and brothers in Christ, uh, sisters and brothers is the same idea. God delights when his church and his people are united and they're getting along. And so he begins to set the stage for that. And I want you to notice that he even recognizes Paul does, that um, he emphasizes the word love for all the saints again in verse 7. We'll look at that in just a little bit. And so Paul is, is so it's this whole idea of, of connecting, connecting, bringing together the people of God. In fact, we have, a, we have a challenge from the Holy Spirit in 1 John 4 and verse 20 where it says there, he says, if you hate your brother, he says, if you hate your brother, there's no way in the world, or if you claim to love God, he says, if you claim to love God and yet hate your brother, he calls you a liar. God says that if we claim, I, I love God, I love Jesus, I'm in love with him, and, and yet you have something against a brother or sister in Christ, he calls us liars. One of the commandments not to do in the book of Exodus, right? He causes lies. In fact, he says there's no way that you can, there's no way that you love, you can hate, love God when you don't love your brother whom you see. How can you love God whom you do not see when you can't love your brother whom you do see? And he's speaking about, you know, spiritual brothers, the family of God. And so, and so Paul is encouraging him on the whole idea of loving the church, the saints of Jesus Christ. He's excited. Paul's excited. He says, I'm thankful. Philemon, I'm thankful. Of course, notice he hasn't addressed the real issue yet. He says, I'm thankful that you love the saints. All the saints. As he begins to more and more so inch his way to the gist of his letter. I want you to notice, first of all, secondly, not just the love for the saints, but he addresses the faith in the Lord. He says, you know, I, I'm thankful for your love for the saints, but he also says, notice point two, he is thankful because I hear of the faith that you have toward the Lord Jesus. He says, I'm thankful because you love the saints, all of the saints, but I'm also thankful because I hear the word is getting around that not only do you love the saints, but that you have faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ. Notice again that he wraps around faith faith in Jesus, uh, love. So I want you to understand that this is a faith that brings about a love. We cannot love the way God would have us love unless we have faith in him who is Savior and Lord of our hearts and lives. And so he connects again the idea of love and faith. He does it in this epistle many a times, and so he encourages him concerning that love that comes from having faith in him. And so I'm encouraged, I'm thankful, I'm excited, Philemon, that you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's that that brings love for the people of God. 
In other words, I can say this, that if you have faith in Jesus, you have to have love for his people because Jesus is about his family. He's about his sons and daughters. And as the Spirit of the Lord loves his love in us and through us, then that love that he sends to us as a result of our faith is going to extend to the body of Christ. Imperfect as we are, as with Onesimus, uh, nonetheless, the love of God is extended through the people of God. And so think about it. Everybody has faith in one way or another, don't they? We all have faith in something. Everybody who sat down this morning, believe it or not, you had faith in your chair. Right? If one of those chairs had only three legs, you would have lost out big time. But we all have faith in something. We all have faith in something. But is it possible that sometimes we have faith in something and that something that we have faith in fails us? Is that possible? Is it possible to have faith in a person, to put all your faith in a person, and then that person lets you down? And so it's important to have faith in the right thing. Paul says, I'm thankful for your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to read to you from um, our, our late brother in Christ, James Kennedy, uh, the founder of Evangelism Explosion. I wanted to read to you these thoughts. It's called faith, the object that per determines the value. So think about this as we think about what our faith is in, right? Have you ever considered what makes faith valuable? Some seem to think that faith has an intrinsic value, and they say, hey, have faith. Hey, have faith. You ever heard that? I submit that faith must be in a valuable object if the faith itself is to be valuable. Faith in the wrong object is not valuable. It is disastrous. You may have faith all the faith you can muster in the brakes of your car. However, if the fluid line is broken, your brakes will not stop the car, and neither will your faith. If you awaken in the night with a headache and you stumble into the dark bathroom, and in faith take a tablet with you, a tablet which you think to be aspirin, but mistakenly take a roach tablet, they may inscribe on your tombstone, he died in faith. But your faith was in an object not worthy of your confidence. Many pregnant women took the mysterious drug thalidomide in the 50s and the 60s in the faith that it would make their pregnancy easier. Their faith did not prevent their bearing deformed children. Faith to have any value must be in a valuable object. When it comes to your eternal welfare, only Jesus Christ is worthy of your confidence and trust. To have faith in anything else or in anyone else is disastrous. Think about that. I mean, let's face it, right? We all put our faith many a times, right? And as we think about, you know, that little box in your all-reliable medicine cabinet. And then you start reading, what do I need to do? And you can't even see the words. And so you kind of take a guess. It says take two of these pills or, or rub it three times a day. Is that a four? No, that's a two. No, that's a three. Anyway, and so we put our faith in these little things that tell us exactly what the doctor told us to do. And so take one tablet. Or is it two? Or is it one? Uh, totally by mouth nightly before bed or... And so we put our faith in these little things, and there's nothing wrong with that. The problem is when we put our faith in this, in other words, where this becomes the most important object of how we're going to get better, and we lose sight of the one who gave man the wisdom to come up with these things to help us improve in our health. And so faith, there is true. It's faith. There is everybody has faith in something. The question is, what is your faith in? What is the object of your faith? Is it Jesus? Because at the end of the day, the object of your faith will determine the end result. Where do we put our faith in? Paul says, I am encouraged. He says, I am thankful that you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Where's our faith in today? That's what brought him joy. 
That's what brought him excitement. Someone has said, faith sees the invisible, believes the incredible, receives the impossible. That's what faith is. It leans on a God that is bigger than we are. It leans on a God that, that knows everything, who is in total control, who is in total charge. And by the way, at the end of the day, the one that heals the body is not the medicine in the cabinet. The one who heals the body is the one who uses the medicine in the cabinet to heal the people who trust in him. And so trusting in Jesus was an excitement of Paul, and he addresses that. And so he, he's speaking to Philemon. He's trying to set the stage for what he's about to do next. And so he, 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 he is thankful for Philemon's love for the saints. He's thankful for Philemon's faith in the Lord. But I want you to notice point three. Put to the test. Put to the test. Notice verse six. And I pray, this is Paul, he says, and I pray, Philemon, I'm thankful for this, I'm thankful for that, and I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective. Notice the choosing, the words he chooses, that the faith, your faith, the sharing of it may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. And so in verses 4 and 5, Paul inches his way to the matter at hand. And in verses 6 and 7, he inches his way even closer to the, to the setting of the stage for what he wrote this letter, that is to solve an unfinished issue, unfinished business. And so he's inching his way in verse 4, he reminds him that he is praying for them. He reminds Philemon that he is praying for him. Hey, I'm praying for you. I remember you in my prayers. I'm thankful then, he says in verse 5. He says, and I am thankful because of your love for the saints. He's headed in that direction. He says, I pray for you. I'm thankful for your love for the saints. And then, by the way, he reinforces that love again in verse 7. So remember, he is entwining his faith with Jesus, with the love for the saints, because the issue at hand is I need you to love your brother. And so he starts in verse 5, thank you for your love for the saints, and then he touches in on it again in verse 7, reinforces that joy that comes from his love for the saints. And then he says, I'm also thankful for your faith, in the Lord Jesus Christ. Think about that. I'm also thankful for your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says, I want someone to say, but then. But then, Paul says, he's exciting, he's encouraging him, he's patting him on the back. You're doing well, Philemon. You have, you have love for the saints and you have faith in the Lord Jesus, but... He says to him, and then he says to him, I pray. I mean, Philemon must have been there. Yeah, everything's going wonderful here, you know. And then Paul says, I pray that you may have the full knowledge, that you may have the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. So he's saying to Philemon, Philemon, everything is well. Everything is fine. You're doing well, Philemon. You're on the right path. You're loving the saints, the people of God, and, and you have faith in the Lord Jesus, but there is still some unfinished business that you need to consider. And so he gets Philemon's attention. Philemon is all excited. Paul is encouraging. My spiritual father is encouraging me. And all of a sudden comes this verse 6. I'm praying that you might experience the whole thing. See, he's saying to him, you need to consider something in order for you to get the full product. He's saying, Philemon, do you want the whole package? You're loving the saints, Philemon. He says, Philemon, you're exercising faith in the Lord Jesus, but there's something missing. And you need to consider what this something is in order to get the complete package the full product of what God ultimately wants to do in your life. 
So he's saying there is room for improvement. You're doing well, but there is room for improvement. There's something else you need to consider. There's something else you need to look into as he begins to set the stage for the gist of the letter that he wrote to Philemon. And so he encourages him. He challenges him. He, you know, Philemon is being, I want you to know that Philemon at this point is committed. He, he's faithful. He's committed. He's passionate for the saints of the Lord. He's passionate for the people of God. And I want you to know that he's committed. He's passionate. He's faithful to the faith that he had in Jesus. He loves the Lord. He's walking with the Lord. He's doing the work of the Lord. He's honoring the Lord. He's looking to exalt the Lord in his life. Everything is going wonderful. But there was something undone that needed to be done yet. And that's what Paul is driving home. Notice that he starts, by the way, it's a good idea, always encourage people. Encourage them on their goodness, on the good things. Focus on the positive things. And then he brings in, he challenges him become, because there's something more that he needed to do. You're doing a good job. You're doing fine. However, there's something else. Something is incomplete. There is some unfinished business, Philemon, that you need to consider. And here's the wonderful thing. That if, if Philemon would consider what Paul is saying... That begins to set the stage for Philemon getting, being everything, everything that God calls him to do, cover every ground. It's a good way to expose and to express the faith that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And isn't that the best way we want to live? Isn't that what excites you? Don't you get excited when you see men and women that are in love with Jesus? Doesn't it excite you? Does it get you excited when you see someone not just proclaiming Christianity, not just proclaiming Jesus, but proclaiming him or declaring him by the life that they live? So Paul is saying, listen, let's go for the full thing. He says, he says the full knowledge of every good thing, Philemon, every good thing that is in us, it's inside of us, the good thing that is inside of us, that is what, what Christ is developing in you. He says, I'm praying that you would experience the full knowledge of everything that is inside of you. So he's telling Philemon, exercise your faith. He said, he's, he's saying, put your faith to the test. He said, begin to exercise it like this as he again inches his way to the issue at hand regarding Onesimus and his relationship with Philemon. And so Paul is encouraging him. I want you to know that this doesn't just encourage the church, but it, it encourages the non-believers, the onlookers, the doubters. It doesn't just encourage them, but it gives them testimony to the reality of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the best way for you and me to share our faith, the best way to share our faith is not necessarily by verbalizing it. If we're not living it, if we're not living out his faith, we can do more harm by verbalizing it. So it's better at that point to be quiet because you're hurting the cause of Jesus Christ. Paul is telling him, you're loving the saints. You're doing a good job. By the way, there's that word all again. You're loving all the saints. You're doing a good job. He says, and you're ex you, 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 you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, but this one thing is missing. That's what the church needs to see. That's what the lost people, that's what people who are searching for answers need to see. Consistency in our conduct and in our life. There was some unfinished business. See, people are not looking so much for an explanation of the gospel. They're looking for a demonstration of the gospel. See, people need to see it being lived in our lives. And I believe that Philemon was a great man of God. I mean, Paul praises him throughout this book, even after these verses. Great man of God. But we want to be everything he calls us to. Sometimes it's easy to look at other brothers or sisters in Christ and think that we're doing pretty good. And we compare ourselves uh, to other brothers and sisters 
that are younger Christians and are being discipled are going through the process of discipleship, and we think we're doing fine. Paul is challenging Philemon regarding some unfinished business, and he sets the stage for what is next. What Paul wants is Philemon, he wants Philemon to experience and to understand the treasures of what it means to be a true follower of Jesus Christ. He wants him to understand and therefore to appreciate. He wants him to experience and therefore to appreciate the full blessings of what he has in Jesus. Amen? See, it, it, you know, I don't know about you, but, I'm, you know, is there some unfinished business in our own hearts and lives? God has turned this into a two or three-part series, by the way. So, but I, I want you to know that, that um, is there some unfinished business in your life? Uh, it, it's, it's, yes, we need to love the saints of Jesus, but we don't always. And we need to have faith in the Lord Jesus, but to what extent? And then there are other issues that God is working in our hearts and in our lives. Something was missing in our kitchen that day. And we knew it just like that. I walked into the first thing I see is this gap. What in the world is that? Someone messed up. Someone didn't finish the job. It was unfinished. It was incomplete. God is looking to complete a work that he began in your life and in my life. Might there be some unfinished business that he is dealing with? And might that unfinished business have something to do? He'll feed off on this. Might it have something to do with a brother or sister that offended you? steps we need to take as Paul leaves the responsibility that he's about to address uh, up to Philemon. Unfinished business, love for the saints, faith in the Lord, put to the test. We'll complete this as Paul now has done what he wanted to do. In the first seven verses, what he does is he, he, um, he begins to set the stage for the mattered hand, the gist of his letter. He's completed that now comes, now comes the address or what he wants to address, the real issue behind this letter. You're doing fine. Let's fix this here. We'll talk about that in a few weeks after the Holy Week service is coming up soon. Uh, but let's take a moment to close in prayer. Let's close in prayer. And I want us to just think about that, my friends here. I want us to just think about that as we close, uh, as we sit here before the Lord, uh, might there be some unfinished business in your life that God is talking to you about? Pray about that. Seek his face and let him guide you as we seek to complete uh, this series of sermons. We thank you, Father, for your grace and love. Thank you for your faithfulness. God, you are gracious. You are merciful. You are loving. You see, you see us so well. You see everything about us. It was the psalmist who said, who am I that you are mindful of me? You know us so well. You know every fault, every failure, every weakness, every struggle. You see every unfinished project in our lives, unfinished business. You see us as you see us. You see us from inside out, and yet you still keep loving us. You still keep patiently working in our lives. You still keep bringing your word to us every Sunday morning. In our devotional lives as well, you bring your word, looking to perfect, to make better saints, men and women, followers of Jesus, declarers of your word in a world that needs that proof so desperately. And so, God, we commit our hearts in you, to you. Lord, speak to me and speak to us these days about the areas of our lives you want to fix. And we thank you for your grace that promises to do that as we allow you to. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Pastor, I have this stand. It is an awesome song called The King is Coming, and we're going to sing the chorus. The chorus, we're going to sing through twice. The King is Coming. Sounding, and now I face it. 
just heard the trumpet sounding, and now his face I see. Oh, the king is coming, the king is coming, praise God. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Thank you, Brother Dave. Praise God for his word and his grace. Amen. Let's continue to pray for neighbors, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. And let's begin to pray also for the upcoming Holy Week services. Let's pray for those services that we would be faithful, not just in praying, but in inviting people to come and hear the word of God. Amen. Father, we thank you again for your grace. Thank you, Father, that, uh, Lord, the greatest demonstration of love and forgiveness and reconciliation is found in Jesus. Thank you, God, that in, the, in reality, we have, if we're followers of Jesus, we've, we've encountered Christ. We've connected with Jesus. We've been approached by Jesus regarding his forgiveness, his grace, his love, and his acceptance of us who are imperfect. Father, if Jesus, who is perfect, can do that, can we do that among ourselves? We thank you for your grace and love, God. We thank you that you came to fix the dirty things. You came to fix broken things. You came to make better what needs to be made better. And you begin with us as individuals, Lord. And so I pray for myself as an individual, and I pray that we pray for each other as individuals. God, continue that fixing process inside of us that we would be like our Savior. We commit this week to you, Lord, guide and direct us, bless us, use us, anoint us, use us in our workplaces, in our communities, where we go, wherever we are, use us for your glory, that Jesus would be glorified in our lives, we pray in his name, amen. And all the people say, amen.